audience heavily conflicted because we are uh, great fans and beneficiaries of our guest of honor tonight, and who is none less than Dr. John Anthony Herring, uh, Chief Emeritus at Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas, Texas, and one of the pioneers in pediatric surgery who has changed our lives as adult spine surgeons. We customarily give a brief intro slide biography for those who might not know Dr. Herring. And so just allow me to pull that up. Uh, colleagues, is the slide coming up? Do you see the yep. slide? Great. We can yes. hear your slide. You're good. Good. Thank you, thank you Dr. Herring, for being here tonight. And uh, he was my teacher. He was a teacher of, I think, all of us, um, especially Scott Wilmot, who also went through UT Southwestern. Brief educational pathway. Uh, Dr. Herring is true Texas uh, royalty. He was born and raised in Vernon, Texas, which is northeast of Dallas, right below the Oklahoma border. Went to UT Austin, went to Baylor College of Medicine, and then switched to Boston, which is also a favorite city of mine, uh, to the Brigham and Women's. There's residency at the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Program from 69 to 73. He had some key uh, meetings there, which he'll tell us about later. And he did his fellowships at Harvard, did a, a traveling fellowship, served in the US Navy with distinction, and then went to a place called Texas Scottish Rite Hospital in 1975. And he served as a chief from 1978 onwards. And if you do the math, 1975 to 2025, that's 50 years, and he is still practicing. And he has been a professor at UT Southwestern, where he's changed all of our lives, as well as being the chief at Scottish Rite. And he made our pediatric rotation the favorite rotation of everybody. I'm not going to read out this list of awards, but it is truly amazing to see the bandwidth and my original home country of Germany and Ireland our academy and certainly the pediatric associations and the scoliosis research society have named him as recipient of lifetime rewards i'm going to stop here shortly because i know that dr herring does not like this but it is an amazing list of accomplishments he belongs to all the major relevant societies especially the dallas county medical society i love that and one thing as as those of you who watch our show know is we want to hear from uh, these uh, difference makers what formed them what prompted them how they got influenced to move into the direction that they did and i'm just going to point out and i'm not going to dwell much on it dr john emmett hall somebody i never had the pleasure to meet but he came from toronto and was an instrumental influence for dr heron in boston and obviously the much beloved and very active professor jean dubusset he wanted to be on tonight but he's not well right now we Wish him all the best, and we hope that he'll be with us at SSF in the future. Then he so often calls in, although it's the middle of the night, and his wife, Anne Marie, and she is a wonderful anesthesiologist who also works at Texas Scottish Rite. Again, uh, the, the Bible of pediatric orthopedics that all of us carry with us uh, was uh, the Tajans, and it was uh, generated out, out of the, from the desk of Dr. Heron out of Texas Scottish Rite. The number of and the bandwidth of fellows and residents trained is astounding and Texas Scottish Rite has now over 20 academic and clinical faculty in three locations. And what always amazed me coming from Germany, this was a top of the line premier hospital that rendered care uh, free of charge. And I thought this was just incredible. Uh, so uh, Tony Herring and the spine is the concept and I'll just shut up and maybe ask Izzy to add a little to it. But uh, we want to recognize and hear and learn more from Tony about this role of translating early concepts of pediatric spine surgery that really we all in modern day general spine surgery benefit from. And again, the John Hall did we say, but also the TSRH story in terms of hardware and three-dimensional hardware for the first time, the modern role of education and research as exemplified. And I will just end here by saying Dr. Herring, and I can't say it any better than that, is a true mensch, a truly amazing human being who's changed our lives and those of a myriad of patients. Izzy, do you want to uh, follow up on that? And sure. The conversation? Th thank you for that, Jens. And uh, Tony, absolutely welcome. It's an honor to, to be able to, to get online with you tonight and to chat and to learn more, more of what we've learned over the years. Um, I was just getting into high school when you were already pioneering all of the, the stuff that we are doing today. So we do stand on your shoulders, which are, are very broad. 
So uh, let us know about you. Let us know about your career, some of the highlights, what you felt were the uh, important milestones in your career. And maybe what really got you into orthopedics? What was it that said, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon? Okay, my turn. Thanks, Go for thanks, it. For, thanks for the nice introduction. I appreciate it. Um, what I thought I would do is go kind of through my history of where I was and what I was doing, because in that uh, travel and that life, I have bumped into many, many of the real pioneers that have changed orthopedic uh, treatment of scoliosis uh, dramatically. So you started with how did I get into orthopedics? So I'll start there. In med school, the buddies I hung out with and I was really at the top of my class with several others, and we were so hot on internal medicine. I was going to either be a cardiologist or a liver doctor, and uh, I matched with the uh, medical program at Harvard at, at Brigham, and that was really my first choice. I, I couldn't believe I survived all the interviews. And late that first that last year of med school, I thought, well, I might be taking care of people with hip fractures and things like that, so I'm going to take an ortho elective. So I took an ortho elective and at Bintov, it used to they put me down in the ER and gave me a fracture book and let me sit and set fractures for hours. And I thought this is the most fun I'd ever had. And so I figured I'd have a career of sitting in the ER and setting fractures and go orthopedic. So uh, they let me have an ortho elective and my medical internship, but they insisted I do a surgical internship after that. So I did general surgery for a year and had about three months at cardiovascular, which later on helped me with thoracic stuff. And then I got in the Harvard Ortho program, the five and a half year program. And one of the first things they did in that era was you started out at Children's Hospital and you had nine months and you were called a pup because you did all the scut work. And the first of the nine months for me was in the plaster room where you stayed with the plaster people all day Every day you had a sort of job there. And we were doing turnbuckle casts for scoliosis. And a turnbuckle cast is the most complicated thing you can imagine. You, the cast people would sew them in a vest and pantaloons of felt and then wrap plaster around everything and then put little thumbtacks where they thought the apex of the curve was, let the cast dry, come back two days later and put hinges in and you would cut the cast open so that you could put these turnbuckles in and crank the patient over against the convexity of the curve. They had an arm in, they had a leg in, and then you wrapped them in full plaster and you cranked them over for about a month. Then you took them to the OVAR and you took them out of that thing and did an in-situ fusion. And then a week or two well, later- Tony, just, just comment on the smell when you took them out of the cast? Uh, you know, the funny part was, as stuffy as, as Harvard places could be, the cast room was wonderful. Most of the people there were Jamaican or Caribbean, and there was always good music going and dancing around and doing these, you know, we really had a good time in the plaster room. So I don't remember the smell being a problem. <laughs> because uh, when you when after the inside fusion, you cranked them back over again over several weeks, and then you sent them home wrapped up for six months in bed. And then you brought them back and took them out and let them have a walking cast for another three to six months. Well, this was a little odd for me because at Baylor, I was aware of Harrington doing Harrington rods. Not being interested in ortho, I hadn't paid much attention to it. But Boston at that point did not have somebody doing competent hearing to rods. One person was doing them incompetent, putting the lower hook on the transverse process and wondering why it got out. And, uh, but then our rotations got, got changed by the a new chief of orthopedics and said, some of you guys are gonna repeat your rotations. So Ray Morrissey and I picked to repeat children. So we got another nine months of children's. So I had 18 months of children's and when I walked back into Children's the first day, I was scrubbing with John Hall. And he was doing an anterior fusion. And he did this amazing incision, which I've never seen. A thoracal abdominal incision, take down the diaphragm. Beautiful. And his he was the most wonderful technician to watch. He just He made it look like it was so easy. Like it was 
playing the violin. And uh, when we finished, I said, Dr. Hall, where can I read about this? This is fantastic. So oh, you can't read about it. Uh, we just developed it. We're going to write it up. The general surgeons don't know how to do it at all. So the next day we go in, and he hands me the knife and said, Tony, why don't you do this one? I thought, oh, brother, this is going to be a rock. Let's go all the way down. And I'd, I'd had enough thoracic, and I'd had quite a bit of exposure to the and Cooley when I was a med student. So I, I knew something about thoracic stuff, and uh, uh, that that was just really an eye opener. And uh, Harrington, in developing the Harrington rod, did some tremendous research. Uh, the the he's re he wrote it up sequentially, and the, the work is impeccable and very very scientific. And when he started doing cases, he would do aliquots of patients and change something every time, like one time no bone graft, next time press graft, et cetera. And yet, when he started publishing it, he got a ton of criticism. And I think they kicked him out of the AOA and uh, really said he was doing stuff that was dangerous. And that's what Boston was sort of still fomenting on. But when Hall came in, you know, boom, there we went. And uh, I remember Hall or Harrington learning to do good fusions from Mo because he didn't have a great fusion technique to begin with. And he went to, and Mo learned how to do Harrington's and Hall went, Harrington learned how to do fusions. Um, I remember John Hall at an SRS, a man gave a page for the hundred Scully cases. And he said, I only had three pseudarthroses. Remember John Hall going to the microphone and saying, well, you know, in my first thousand, I haven't had a pseudarthrosis. I think maybe you need to learn how to do a fusion. And uh, that, that was good. And then a subsequent event at the SRS, which I hadn't planned to say, was uh, when Wally Babesco presented his new hook. He added a hook to the Harrington rod at the top and made it a little bit more stable. And then he made this charade of having the patient walk to the recovery room which was filmed and put on that's incredible TV. And when he presented it at the SRS, as he closed his presentation, he said, and that proves the stability of this new technique. And Hall went to the microphone and said, it does not. It proves the instability of the surgeon. And it was one of those, one of those moments that you don't have anymore. <laughs> But there, there, was, was, there was a, a little bit of collegial jealousy oh, with Bechko and Hall, both from he, Toronto. He, 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 the, the, history, the history was there. Yeah, yeah. He did not uh, do, do honest things in Dallas either. He was a problem. Um, the, uh, the next thing really to come along was uh, Eduardo Luque. And I'll jump into a little history here again in a minute, too. We said that Hibbs was the very first person to do spine surgery fusions for scoliosis, and he was in New York doing that. And one of his, his writings was very specific. It said, the fusion should extend from the upper, the least rotated vertebra at either end of the curve. The fusion needs to extend that distance for it to be stable. Well, another Texan who started out as a chiropractor was Joe Risser. And he also ended up then going to New York and working with Hibbs. And he also published several hundred cases and then moved to Los Angeles. And while in Los Angeles, he wrote the paper in which he noted that scoliosis really stops progressing when growth stops. And if you look at the iliac crest, you can see a line of ossification. And when that fuses, patient's growth is finished. So that was a, a very large addition. And he was a very, very capable there in, uh, in Los Angeles. And one of his residents, Eduardo Luque, finished his residency, married Risser's daughter, and took her to Mexico City, and in Mexico, he couldn't keep his patients in cast. You know, all the other scoliosis work really with Harrington. You had to have a cast or your hooks would cut out. And so Luque came back to San Diego and gave a talk about how he was passing wires under the lamp and tying down the Harrington rods. And with that, 
he did not put them in cash and he did not lose fixation. And I happened to be there in the Navy and I heard his, his lecture and it went from that sort of rational thing to about five other totally crazy things. I mean, one, he showed an 80 year old woman that he did a fusion and he poured methacrylate from top to the bottom of the wound so it would be nice and solid. And uh, several other things that you just would, would never do. But uh, in my Navy time, I got a traveling fellowship from the OREF and went to a number of places. I went to a whole lot of places. I went to Inneking, I went to Great Ormond Street, uh, I went to Toronto with the kids. But I also went to Luque for two weeks and I took Al Crawford with me because we were good buddies from the Navy. And um, we then scrubbed on a lot of cases with Luque and it was amazing. I mean, he, he, he worked fast, he could pass the wires quickly and he loved to go shopping. He'd come to Dallas a lot and go shopping at the hardware stores and buy rod twisters and all kinds of gadgets and take them back and use them in surgery till they rusted out because he didn't have a way to make them out of stainless steel. And that went on uh, for a long time. We, saw, we kept seeing them over the years. We were good friends. Uh, people that don't know Lukey should look at a picture of Salvador Dali because Lukey had these handlebar mustaches and a thin face and he looked very much like Salvador Dali and sort of had his same personality. He was always coming up with something. But when he, we were seeing him in, in Mexico, he decided he didn't like distraction as he was doing it with the Harrington rod. So he started putting in just a, a rod and he would take a, a file and try to file grooves in the rod interoperatively. And then as he passed his wires, he would hook them into the, wire, the rod, but the grooves weren't deep and the rods didn't really Linda, stay. Linda, lost sound. Can we check? Tony, can you unmute? I think you're somehow oh, mute. I hit mute. Uh, no, can you hear me now? He's yes. good. I can, I can still hear him, Yes. Yeah, we heard him, Yeah, It might be your end. Maybe I bumped him. He's here. Um, so uh, we came back and tried some of those. I, in the, that early era, when I started doing some Luque wires, I did it on patients that were already paralyzed. They either had spina bifida or severe uh, cerebral palsy and really didn't use it for idiopathic cases. And I had one case which the uh, wires, we did the wires like that and the rod wasn't uh, secured. And the mom called me and said, Dr. Herring, uh, my child has passed the rod through the rectum. And I said, no, that, that can't, that can't be. It must have been, I said, Dr. Herring, I'm a registered nurse. I know where the rectum is. And sure enough, this rod had come out and there was nothing to show for it. We hospitalized the kid and put him on some antibiotics and nothing really happened. But that sort of uh, made us think of it again. And, and every time you'd see Luke at a meeting, he'd have new rods in his pocket and pull them out. So the next thing was an L rod, then on the end. So the L's would hook under the lamina and the rods couldn't migrate. And there really no distraction. It was all side loading and some rotation. But it was pretty remarkable. The next step, which always amazes me, and I look back, how many Harrington rods do you think Hall and Rowe and Moe and Bradford and Winter and everybody put in? And they did it. And I did it just like them without looking at the lab. We were making all those spines flat. And especially if we went into the lumbar spine, we were producing lumbar lack of lordosis and tilting them forward sometimes. Well, look, he just started bending the fur, bending the rods and bending in calcosis and lordosis. And the rest of us have to go like this. Why didn't we think of that? Of course, there are two planes in rotation. There are three planes. There are all kinds of planes of rotation. So that um, was a real step forward because then you could apply that to any technique and, and begin to think more holistically about the spine. And along came Cottrell and Dubasset. And Jean Dubasset was and still is, I think, the person that understands the deformity of scoliosis better than any person I have ever met. And I remember going to see him when he first came out with the Cottrell Dubasset instrumentation. And 
one night he took me in his old beat up the du Chavot car over to an engineer he was working with who was working on a Atari computer and making little plates that you could turn that looked like vertebra and then being able to flip it in space and look at it in all different dimensions like none of us had ever done or had ever seen. We, you couldn't get a 3D reconstruction from a CT scan. And I don't think they even had CT. And uh, through that understanding, you know, he just, every step of the way was enlightening all of us. And whenever you talked to him, you would just come away saying, I wish I'd written down the whole uh, conversation. And along the way, we got to be very good friends. We visited him a number of times. And then he came to do a sabbatical with us for six months and the other six months with Harry Shufflebarger. And that's when he looked up all the cases that turned out to be the crankshaft phenomenon. And so he did all the work on that paper. I wrote all the paper and uh, really made a difference with that. I as we now understood what was going on with spinal growth. And uh, the uh, one day uh, he was coming out of the, uh, on a Monday, he was gonna go into the OR. And I remember him coming up to me and saying, Tony, I want to tell everyone, I have learned to say in the American way, the letter H. When I knew, need the instrument, I will say, nurse, hand me a ha ha poo and a poo colder. <laughs> Which is, we love that because he just, he had that ability to communicate in not so good English, but he just turned out to be the, a person that just led us all beautifully. And, um, we got into the instrumentation, instrumentation uh, realm. We wanted to modify the CD so that we could have open hooks at the ends and be able to kind of cantilever the rod into an open hook. And we sent the design to Cottrell, who we didn't know very well at that time. It was really before John's visit with us. And they said, no changes can come from anywhere else. All the changes have to come from France. So. An engineer working with us put it together and we set up a system we call the TSRH system, which was considerably more user friendly. It was basically all, all the same uh, concepts, but much easier to use. And uh, at one point that became the leading selling instrumentation in the country. And, and they ended up buying the Cottrell Dubassay company, uh, the company that, uh, that had the TSRH. Maybe I'll stop a minute and see if I, I, I can keep going, but I've used up a fair well, bit. The, the, the evolution you're going through is just phenomenal. And it's it's stuff that uh, some have witnessed and seen. But what, what's most interesting is my current fellows, uh, I'll show x-rays of an old TSRH long-term follow-up that comes out. Do you know what instrumentation that is? Uh, my favorite is showing them the Zilke instrumentation. They have no... Yeah clue from from Zilke or any of the ant or any of the work that Hall uh, had had pioneered. So it's just phenomenal to hear how the, the stories developed and um Edward and Luke instrumentation, that's another one. Um they they, they have, have zero uh, yeah. exposure to to that concept today. Um even hooks now uh, it have become a lost art. But maybe maybe I'll ask I'll ask this where, where do you think we're going now with scoliosis surgery. What What is going to be the next phase for adolescent idiopathic curves treated surgically? What do we need to do? Yeah, I, I think about that a lot, and I have some guesses. Uh, I think we've got it about as sophisticated and functional posteriorly as, as we can. Uh, Obviously, we've got a lot to do with early onset and other things like that. But, uh, you know, the tethering has come around. And uh, I wrote a critique of it by accident. But, uh, I just reviewed the paper, and then they made me publish my, my critique from my old fellow, Peter Newton. Uh, and I said, I think they've proved the concept that you can tether it and have growth correct the curve. What we don't know is exactly what age and stage of development it needs to be done. And we don't really know what severity of curve needs to be done. And we really don't know what's gonna happen when the cords break. And as Peter Newton said, well, I think they're all gonna break at one point. 
but you know, you break the rod in the pseudarthrosis and it, it tends to progress. So I don't know what's going to happen with the broken rods. But I've been thinking for several years that if you had some really good robotics that helped you not only with screw placement, but lung retraction and exposure, that the anterior approach might come back because the correction anteriorly was always so much fun. I mean, you just took the disc out, corrected the curve, derotated it, and you had a great grasp on the vertebrae. You could make that better and you could make the end connections better so that you didn't get pseudarthroses and maybe plate that end uh, disc that you've used and not have a big scar, not have a big incision. And I would look to some, some sort of brilliant robotic work to, uh, you know, I had a, I had a robotic herniectomy, herniorophy, and it was amazing. The guy sitting over in the corner of the room and I walked out with no pain and took a bike ride the next day. It was like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. So there's a lot of stuff with uh, AI and robotics that I think could take us back in another direction. That's my guess. And if I were younger and had some reason to go after it, I might try to try to work that out. Well, well, there's some in, there's some inspiration for the younger uh, participants in the audience that are interested in in the scoliosis and, and deformity to to hear those words of encouragement and look at the the new technologies and and figure out how to optimize the the result. What what about moving on to to the hospital, the evolution of hospitals? You've obviously been very yeah. very. Uh, important at TSRH, uh, chief of surgery there for well over 40 years, I believe it it was, and the evolution of the hospital. Um, uh, how about giving us a, a synopsis of what TSRH was, how it is today, and where you see TSRH moving into the future? All right. Let me start with how I got there. I was in the Navy in my second year, and realized I needed a job and my phone wasn't ringing. And you know, when you're a year and a half or so out of your residency, they're not thinking about you anymore. And I only saw two jobs, one of which was totally untenable. And a guy in the Navy with me said, you gotta go to Dallas and look at this little hospital that's called the Scottish Rite Hospital. I said, well, I'm, I'm from Texas, I never heard of it. No, you won't have heard of it, but they're gonna build a big new hospital and they're looking for somebody to come and be there a couple of years and be the chief. So you got to go look at it. So I went to look at it, much at my wife's distress because she's from Rhode Island. We'll skip back to England. And uh, I liked it. So I went and looked the second time. And I was thinking I might take it. So I called John Hall and I said, uh, this is what I'm looking at. And he said, well, be sure you get everything in writing. Because when I came to Boston, they reneged on half of what my they promised me, so get everything in your contract. So then what are they going to pay you? I said, well, $40,000. And they've offered me uh, 100000 at another place. And uh, I'm making thirty-eight. in the Navy. got two kids. I said, no, you got to make it. Be so I came in this big meeting I hadn't anticipated with the chairman of the board who just stepped down as the governor of Texas, that Alan Shivers, big powerful guy. And I said, I'm really interested in the job. I just wanted to discuss it. Okay, what do you want to discuss? So well, I'd like to get the things we've talked about in my contract, you know. So he said, we don't do contracts. What else are you going to talk about? Okay, well, I need to make uh, 50000 I think, as a starting salary because I've got two kids and I don't have any money. And, uh, but no, the salary is 40000 So I said, okay, I'll take it. Best negotiation I ever did. <laughs> I don't know why, why I was so excited about the job. And, uh, and you know, the hospital has a lot of, uh, of, su of support. And it was around that time that a man gave the hospital a ranch. And he didn't think there was much to the ranch. But it turned out to be an oil field of about 180,000 acres. And over the years has really enabled us to, to go without charging for all those years. And even now, it, it really helps our ability to do things beyond what we can earn. And it's just, it, it, I liked everybody and I loved the patient population. And uh, it just, anything I wanted, 
if it made sense for the patients I got. So I didn't come really uh, thinking I, I did. In fact, I told my wife two things when I, we were dating. I didn't want to go to Texas and I didn't want to do academic orthopedics. And, uh, but I started seeing things I needed to work up and, and research on. I maybe mentioned to the board why I needed some money from this. And I didn't maybe go to the board meeting. The next time I bumped into the board meeting, oh, well, you got that stuff started. You know, we gave you the money. How far have you gotten with it? And so I felt this sort of, I mean, my, my basic philosophy has always been make the best of the opportunities that come your way. Do the best you can. And I, so many opportunities just flowed through the door that uh, the place just grew and grew. And, you know, you have to think back in that era, pediatric orthopedics was done as a specialty thing in just a few hospitals, you know, like Newington and Boston, and Toronto, all those places. But there weren't a lot of pediatric orthopedists out, and most of the general orthopedists did a lot of peds. So us young guys, you know, like me and Crawford and Dinsinger, all of us grew up in a time when everything was blooming. Everything was coming to us that used to not come to us. So we had this enormous inflow of very interesting, challenging patients. And then we had the tremendous support to take care of them. So uh, I knew I wasn't very good at interviews, interviewing people and reading their CVs and knowing uh, how good they really were. But I knew how good my fellows were at the end of the year. So most of my hiring was the very best of our fellows. And uh, that really worked out because we had such a group that we were like a family. We knew each other's families. We knew each other's kids. We went to our kids' soccer games. We went out to parties together. We just had a, a, a very, very strong family. And like even now, John Birch and Charlie Johnson are retired, but they're here every day just like me. And I'm working about a third of a day every day, and I'm still here. And uh, and, and nobody seems to mind this being. I, I think my door's going to be locked one of these days, and I can't get in. I'll, I'll know it's time to quit. But uh, it's just been to me a phenomenal opportunity. And everybody, uh, I didn't mess up the microphone. It, microphone okay? No, you're good. Yeah, I think everybody got stimulated by the same thing. You you saw the possibilities of things you could do and publish. Not, we never pushed, said, you've got to publish, publish, publish. That wasn't, we said, we've got to solve problems. And when we see something isn't working, we've got to figure out how it isn't working and how we can make it better. And that's, that's why I studied Perthes so much. I am still puzzled by Perthes. And so I want to find an answer. So it pushes me to keep working on it. And, uh, but I never thought I had to get X number of publications. That didn't, I like to get papers at meetings because a, you study your patients well and know them well. B, you meet people that know a lot more than you do, and you can discuss things with them, and you can come back with a whole bunch of new ideas. And so I think the way we work and the way Posner and SRS work, uh, really, it's really collegial. We're not really fighting or competing against each other. We're just making our life, taking care of children better. And it's such a fun life and fun thing to do that... Uh, I don't feel like I've ever had to work. So, so where where are we going to go with pediatric orthopedics and with pediatric orthopedic hospitals? What what do you see in the future for that subspecialty? How how's it going to evolve? Um, it's, that's really a a very pertinent question, like for us right now in Dallas, because. Uh, we work at the children's hospital here too. We're the only orthopedist there and we mainly do trauma and infections. We do all the cold orthopedics over here. And now the children's hospital in Dallas, which is just a mile from here in the university, are going to join together and build a whole new, very big hospital. And it made the papers a few days ago, so it's, it's open knowledge, but a, a possibly much as a $5 billion hospital and our role in that uh, has to be defined. What are we going to do in that? And we don't know at this point. And they don't know the whole breakdown either. You know, it's just in the early stages of figuring it and how they're figuring people will want to come to the center of a city when most people want to go to the periphery and go to a hospital close to where they live. So how that's all going to work out, I don't know. But I think this is, you know, the, the peripheral hospitals are a big thing now. You know, you don't want to have to go all the way. 20 miles into town when you 
kid breaks their arm, you want to go to the local place, but you want to go to a good place. And you want to go to a place that, you know, practices top of the line care. And that's, that's what we're doing now in our Frisco unit. And I think that's what all of us are seeing around the country that uh, it's, it's not so centralized. Uh, I think pediatric orthopedics will continue to subdivide. You know, my fellows now don't just look for a peds job. They look for a peds job dash neuromuscular or a peds job dash with spine or another sort of subspecialty within peds. And that's what the people are hiring. They're saying, well, we've got somebody doing scoli. We don't have anybody doing foot. So would you want to come and do foot and ankle? Or, uh, and so I think you're going to see further subdivision of peds. And it's just like when orthopedics separated out of general surgery and our orthopedics separated into joints and trauma and all these things are natural progression of us getting higher and higher technology that you have to narrow your field to be able to master that particular subfield. Tony, just sort of catching in on that. So uh, Robert Frank from Arizona has a great question. I, it's on my mind also because I see these patients all the time. And that is pediatrics and adults are kind of just an artificial differentiation. CP patients after they're 18, spina bifida, when they're 25, 35, to uh, quote Robert, um, they float into adult spine clinics and we just go like, oh my God. Um, so is this artificial distinction still relevant? Should there be an expanded horizon or a subspecialty care for a neuromuscular spine or something like that? Where do you see that development possibly going? Thank you, Robert, for your question. Yes, I... I've been to a seminar where that was being discussed too. And I think there are some people that are really interested in this transitional care, this sort of age group that they're not, they're not uh, kids, but the adult people don't know what to do with them. So like in probably the best example that we're doing that's kind of working well is in uh, complex hip reconstruction because the total hip guys don't want to do periacetabular osteotomy. So we're getting up to early to mid thirties in our patient selection with, uh, with GANS osteotomies. When our chairman of the board heard us say that, they, he was kind of blown away. Said, what? We have 35 year old people here. Said, well, not very healthy. But the beautiful thing they've done here is they've, they've really let us practice medicine. And so where we know we have to kind of draw a line is in scoliosis. We don't mind following the spine deformity cases, but you really can't go into adult back pain era and all of that. That's that's not for us to do. And so how do you how do you steer the steer the cattle through one one shoot or the other? Uh, and I don't think there's and like my prosthetic patients, I still see some of them into their mid twenties, the kids with amputations. Um, Anybody have a better answer to that? I don't have an answer, really. I think it's going to have to develop. There have to be centers that do that, and orthopedists who do that, and, and uh, other people, you know, like uh, physical medicine people and other people that have a lot to offer the patients so that it's still more of a, of a group uh, kind of attack rather than single single practitioners. Yeah, Tony, hey, Tony. That's, that's that's sort of what happened in spinal cord injury. The PM and R people sort of, uh, you know, took that field over uh, from the orthopedists um, who were not only the spine surgeons, but also, the, you know, rehabilitation guys. Um, and we sort of lost that, you know, lost uh, control of that population. And now most of the centers are staffed by PM and R with you know, maybe a, an orthopedic spine as a consultant. So it's kind of, it's sort of flipped. And, you know, you're talking about maybe the same thing um, happening in, in fields other than just spinal cord injury. So do you think it's working or do you think it's uh, needs some alignment? No, it seems to be, you know, because there's so many other parts of taking care of chronic spinal cord injury that, that frankly are, are not of interest to orthopedic spine surgeons, you know, your bladder care, skin care, you know, stuff like that. So, it probably has worked out better for the patients. They probably do get followed uh, medically better. Um, and then their spine needs are addressed uh, on a consulting basis. So probably hasn't been a bad thing. Rick, you're muted. Tony, I have a question for you. You mentioned that, you know, with our internal fixation today, you can get really amazing corrections. And you're talking about with the advent of new technology, robotics, maybe even do more anteriorly. But are there any companies or any ideas from 
you and some of your your uh, peers about thinking of some type of uh, way of limiting the length of the fusion with some type of motion sparing internal fixation and I don't even know what it would look like but it seems to me that we're we're doing the same thing we've always done and we do it better and what comes to mind is that one of our friends Terry Marnay who was the inventor of the long, lumbar disc replacement he talks about in adults if we do an artificial disc in somebody that has bad facet joints that they will actually remodel now I didn't really believe that until I saw one or two of my own patients and we got CT scans and they did remodel. So I'm wondering if, and I'm not talking about artificial disc for these people. I'm just talking about a, a different type of internal fixation to limit the length of the fusion so that when they're 18, you don't have to send them to Izzy or to Jens. Well, I don't know. Um, you, uh, you know, we've also talked about in the past, how stiff should your construct be? Should there be some motion to encourage fusion or is too much motion going to encourage pseudarthrosis? And then you take somebody like an osteogenesis imperfecta where the, you'll get bone sort of wasting away because it's too rigid. And I think the whole tethering thing gets into that. Like one of the reasons to do the tether, like I've had a couple of my kids that have missing upper extremities and they're getting a progressive scoliosis and they need their mobility. So we've done some tethers. But how much motion do they get out of the tether? It's really not much. It's this kind of jog of motion. And maybe you could put more motion in, but anytime it moves, it's going to loosen. If your cord doesn't break, then the screws are going to loosen. Or constant motion is really not tolerated in bone metal interface. And uh, so I have, uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm amazed too at some of the, uh, the degrees of correction we get now are much greater than you know 10 and 20 years ago and a lot of that's due to better monitoring you know with cranial monitoring we now can back off and back off and come back the next day and do things that we never used to do uh, by trying to get the spine straight and or take a 90 degree curve down to 10 and, uh, and then the really complex stuff like the vcr is that uh, one of Dan Scotto and my team just does beautiful VCR, but he's so meticulous and so careful. And uh, that's spectacular when you see these horrendous deformities be uh, beautifully corrected. And uh, but it just that that's really for a few very talented individuals to do, I think. So, so Tony, it, all this spine stuff excites all of us, but let's move off spine for a bit. You're an yeah. avid cyclist. You're a pianist and you're a photographer. Tell us about all that. Um, well, I used my favorite thing sport was tennis. I played a lot of tennis, and Al Crawford and I were on the tennis team in the Navy, and that was a big deal because they would buy all our equipment. They would say, "Well, you got to cancel clinic today because we've got a match over with Loma Linda or somebody," and uh, and the admiral played tennis, and there was a dentist that played with the admiral who had, play, had won the all-Navy tournament and lost the all-military tournament to Arthur Ashe when Arthur Ashe was wow. So this was the Admiral's part. So do you, do you blast it at the Admiral or do you try to get it by this pro? You know, <laughs> you can't hit the Admiral in the face with the ball. And even though Crawford wanted to, I didn't let him do that. And... Uh, <laughs> But as I got older, my and I started biking. Oh, I did have this is a worth telling story. I was a medical intern, and one day my attending came in in bike clothes. His name was Paul Dudley White, and he was a very famous cardiologist because he had been the cardiologist for Dwight Eisenhower when he had his heart attack. Wow. And he, he was 75 years old, and he came in in bike clothes. I said, Dr. White, did, did you bike to work? I said, yeah, I've been biking to work my whole career. Hmm. I can do that. So we lived in Arlington. So I started biking to work to the Brigham. And I've biked to work ever since. And I still bike to work. Not every day. Uh, uh, most days. And uh, and then I started doing some bike racing because I started doing these rallies. And I found out I could uh, kind of be in the lead group. And I've done some uh, bike for the, the, the uh, senior games, senior Olympics. The best I've done in senior Olympics is seventh. I haven't ever gotten on the podium. But I, you go thinking you're going to blow everybody away. But, uh, 
I could maintain a couple of years ago was my last race. I could maintain 22 miles an hour on a uh, on a time trial for six miles, and uh, going with and against the wind and making a turnaround. So that that's about the best I've done. But that's my uh, my biking story. I, I, I have I have like five bikes. I have a lot of good bikes. I have a, I have a beautiful brand new ten thousand dollar bike that I bought. It's so cool. Um, what else did you ask? Oh, music. I, music started, yes. I started playing the piano when I was about four years old. And my mom played the piano and she was a pianist for the church. And uh, she tried to get me to take lessons. And I took these lessons, but I didn't want to be in there. I wanted to be playing with my buddies. So the teacher would play a melody and show me the paper. And I would just listen to her melody and then play it back. And so I never learned to read music. But over the years, I just got more and more able to play uh, the, the way I play the piano. I can't play classical, and, but I love to put something on, you know, like uh, uh, I can just play along with. I do that a lot. And people like, you know, I uh, can't think of all the names, but I like, I like to do that. And I'll play Christmas carols every year and uh, do stuff. I write some poetry. I had some poetry published. Not very good at it, but uh, I do like to just try things and do stuff. I, uh, I enjoy uh, thinking. G give, give us a, a memorable moment of your career, something that, that stands out that you say, this is something that I'm really proud of. Um, well, this is not orthopedic. But I was even asked, better, even I better. Was asked to speak about the origin of our hospital to our board. So I got some books and I read about polio. And I got so interested. I said, that, you know, people don't know any of this. I don't know any of this. I, I was, you know, there was a girl in my class in first grade that got polio, but that was about the end of my knowledge. And so I decided we needed to put together a film about polio, make a documentary film. So we hired a documentary filmmaker and by taking care of a very rich kid who just had a bowed femur got a $250,000 grant from them to uh, to do something so we made a film about polio we we went to many different places we went to Boston Los Angeles Jackie Perry's in it uh, uh, and uh, we we put together a really good film and we at one point, we were interviewing two of the people that got the Nobel Prize for developing the, the vaccine or the virus culture that enabled to get a vaccine. And one was Dr. Weller. And we were setting up his living room and he was getting very nervous. So the director said, get him out of here. So I went to his office and said, let's just let's talk here. And I sat on this couch about six feet away and he tossed me a folder to take a look at this. So I opened it up and I said, oh, my gosh, is, is that what I think it is? He said, yeah. That's my Nobel Prize. What should I do with it? I don't know. He said, well, if I give it to Harvard, they're just going to put it in the closet somewhere. But I don't know what to do with it. And I'm 80-something years old. And that was when, that was the moment. It's like, oh, my gosh. And uh, I think uh, that film did really well. We, we got it onto PBS showed it in some movie theaters and we put it in to get the Academy Award nomination for a documentary. And we made the top 100, we made the top 50, we made the top 55, and then we got notification that we made the final 12. And the final 12, then you go out to LA and they show it in Hollywood, they show it in New York, and all the people vote on it. And so the Tuesday morning, five nominees came out, but it did not get them. And about an hour later, a woman called from the Academy to our director and she said, I'm with the Academy. You guys got screwed. Home box office pulled a fast on you. You should be nominated. So every time I see the Oscars like this weekend, I think about where they're sitting, how they get to go down from the back to the front, and what you say, what you do with your little notepad. I just, we had this dreams of, God, we're going to be there. And, uh, so I would say that is this kind of a bittersweet, high low sort of thing. It, uh, it came so close, and it really is a good film. If you want to see it, you can see it on, uh, you can go to Amazon and just Google 
polio, or it's actually called a fight to the finish stories of polio. But it is a very uh, well done film. It covers all the bases from what the patients were like, what the research was like. And it's a happy film and it got terrific reviews in the New York Times by A.O. Scott. He said it's really a happy film and shows so much about uh, this disease. I made another film then about DeBakey, Michael DeBakey, and I had trained under him as a medical student. And that's a good film too. And you can Google DeBakey and uh, rent it for $2.50 and we don't get any money. So it's not, it's not a conflict of interest. But uh, those were two, I kind of got up on those tangents. But, but I, let me do you one more quick. I was sitting in my office one day and the phone rang and it was about six years after Tajan had died. The publisher said, would you guys be interested in doing the Tajan textbook? It's 10 years back, it needs to be redone. And we'd be happy to have you do it as a single center. Uh, oh, God, what an opportunity this is. Yes, I said, we could do that. So I came back the next Monday morning to our group meeting. I told them, I've got the greatest thing to tell you. We have gotten signed up to do the Tajan textbook. They said, we're going to kill you. You're not going to leave this room alive. We're going to do it. Seven of us are going to do it and write 2,500 page, three volume textbook. But yeah, we're going to do it. So four editions later, we're still doing it. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm done. That's that was awesome. another sort of one of those opportunities. It, opportunity comes along, you do the best way that you can, and it, which came in the telephone. I wasn't lobbying for it, and uh, I found out other people were, but I never thought about it. I wasn't a big buddy of Tajan's, and uh, I went to the, some of his meetings, but that was great, uh, great stories. Absolutely great stories. Uh, uh, anyone else have any questions for Tony? Yeah, I was going to Tony. Looking ahead, uh, you know, we trained, um, you know, in an era where a lot of stuff was done by hand, and then you know, intraoperative fluoroscopy, and then start rolling into, you know, navigation and robotics. Do you think it's a? Is it a good thing? Do you think that the young guys are are lacking a little bit of the the more basic um, anatomy because their hands haven't been all over the spine like like uh, the old guys? Um, do you think it's going to ultimately make us better surgeons or, um, uh, you know, or, or is it training differently and, and guys are going to miss out? Um, you know, good, solid technological advances are wonderful. And scoliosis has had more than almost any other area of orthopedics. Uh, I think you lose a few things like the, te the technique of fusion, how the pseudoarthrosis we were discussing the other day, and they kept talking about what kind of instrumentation. And I kept raising my hand, what kind of fusion are you going to do? The instrumentation failed, instrumentation failed because not because the rod was too stiff or too flexible, but because the fusion didn't fuse. So go back and look at your fusion techniques. I love taking the iliac crest bone graft. That was sort of the best fun of the procedure. And that is wonderful graft. And other things don't quite measure up, but we certainly don't see pseudoarthrosis very often. We still see them very rarely. But I think things like that, you got to decide which basic pieces you give up and which basic pieces you you pick up hook on to. But I think most of the technological advances are great. I think maybe too many people are doing tethering without kind of knowing what's going to happen next. I don't know. I have no data on that. But, uh... Thanks to Linda. We have, by the way, links for the films uh, in the chat room. So want to uh, recognize that. I, I heard about that polio film, but I haven't seen it. Tony, so you going and picking up on what Jack just said, you were an amazingly calm and patient teacher. And I don't know how or who influenced you that, how much was this in you, how much uh, was uh, learned behavior from Dr. Hall and others, uh, because you've had so many giants in the field that you interface with. What's your advice in terms of how we should teach and how do you have this kind of a calm, cool confidence in the aura that has inquisitiveness? Discovery allows for trainees in this a world that allows no mistakes uh, to kind of foster without undue tension. I, I have certainly followed John Hall's uh, how his how he did things very very much as, as much as I could. And I think most of the people trained under him tried to imitate him. No, none of us quite had the ultimate skill that he had, but a lot of his skill was things like just great pre preparation and great uh, anticipation and great focus on the patient. You know, some of the 
reasons I didn't want to do orthopedic uh, academics was a lot of the professors I had in my training didn't do much clinical. And they kind of, it was hard to get them to come see their patients. Paul would make rounds twice a day and see the patients. And the patients were obviously the main focus. And if you start with that and get your ego out of it, it's not a matter of whether you have to spend 10 more minutes doing something. Or not. It's does the patient need what? And you get the patient what they need. Uh, I think if you are very patient focused and you get to know them, you ask them questions that you don't have to ask them and learn about them. And I, I never, I've never been a harsh teacher. Now, when Crawford and I were together in San Diego, he was bad cop and I was good cop. And the residents could just get taken to pieces and he would walk off and I'd try to put them back together. And he was, it was kind of a funny thing because it was clearly a, a divide there. And uh, he accomplished a ton of stuff. He's recently got a whole lot of new honors, still my best friend. But um, we, we were different. Uh, I, I've never chewed a resident or somebody out. You know, I, I, my, a little suggestion of maybe you should think about doing it differently. And certainly if you ever do have somebody that's really boring on incompetence, you got to take it on and you got to meet with them privately and help them work out their problems. And most of the time you can work it out and occasionally somebody has to go away. But uh, I, I think you know, one thing about riding your bike and riding your bike to work, you are the lowest common denominator on the road. <laughs> the, dogs, the dogs have the right of way over you. Okay. So if you think it's pretty cool, get out on your bike and try to make it through Dallas traffic all the way home. And you'll find out that, that, that you're not all that important. And uh, that's, and none of us are. We're human beings. We're there to take care of patients. We're very, I feel so lucky that I've been able to have this career. I've, I can't imagine how it all developed this so beautifully. And uh, just, and they're, they're letting me hang around now. You know, I, I'm doing all sorts of different stuff, but I'm working too, and I'm seeing patients, and uh, I come and go as I want to. And I'm 82. I'm, I'm not a young, I'm not, not so young anymore, but I don't think I'm 82. The former resident, Dr. Blumenthal, has a question. He has his hand raised, and then we'll probably have to come to a close as long as we could. This could go on forever, but Scott, do you want to take us out with a final yeah, question? Yeah, actually, Ian's kind of stole a little bit of thunder there of, of the teaching style. I mean, it was great to, to hear this trip down memory lane because Jens and myself were, were, were there. We were pups at the time, and I can remember Dr. Herring say, hey, I need you to go to the airport to pick up Eduardo Luque. And you get Eduardo Luque in the car with you for a half hour, and I kind of knew I was going to go into spine then, so it was, you know, fascinating. But the parade of people we had coming in back then were all, were all the names. He, he didn't even mention, you know, I, I remember spending dinners uh, with Art Steffi, and he was coming to be a hand professor, and he said, I want to show you this little thing I'm working on with screws and plates and stuff. I mean, fascinating. And 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 one final thing, because I, I do want to follow through on on your calm demeanor of teaching and, and you know, in, in a calm way. One of my memories was we were doing a club foot surgery and you were walking me through it and you said, okay, now we got to like release this tendon here. And I cut the tendon and he goes, no, that was the, and I'm going to get the anatomy wrong. That was the nerve, but you did it in such a calm way. And, you know, we, we finished the case. I would never do that again, but you know, it would have been an opportunity to really, you know, become a, a very negative situation. But that was the calm teacher that you were. Yeah, you made mistakes and you're never going to do it again, but you messed up. And, you know, the, the way that you handled that helps me now with our fellows when when we run into adverse situations. So thank you for being this a wonderful role model. Thank you. I, just, uh, I love the teaching part, you know, and uh... The, the, the people that are coming to do fellowships now are so accomplished. I mean, we just interviewed 30 people and they were just off the wall accomplished. It's just amazing what all they've done and what their futures are. And one guy came in with the, the fastest mile in NCAA history from his college career. Who, that, who, was, who was chasing him? Yeah, exactly. He still holds the record. And... <laughs> Yeah, you, 
You know, Tony, you're exactly right because we just finished interviewing 40 fellows. Yeah. They come in with CVs that look like somebody that's been in practice 10 years. Yeah. Amazing. And and also amazing stories. I mean, we had one drop out at 14, no. went back to get all honors in college and everything. But anyway, this has been wonderful. Yeah, it is really. Uh, and you people say, well, medicine's not attracting people, but it really is. And it's attracting very, very good people. And orthopedics is. And I think we're all lucky to be able to do it because it's just so rewarding and fun to do. This is fun. Sorry, go ahead. It is fun. It's been, it's it's been an absolute fun evening chatting with you, Tony. This has been wonderful. I've enjoyed it. This has been good. I didn't realize I was going to have a, a whole bunch of experts on the other side of the screen here. And uh, <laughs> Uh, this is just delightful. You know, you're you're an old world guy with old world values that you've maintained through your whole career. It's a it's a great example for all of us. You know, thank you. Thanks for and sharing a, your life for with us, Tony. This was, this was a lot of fun. And Very Tony, happy. we all learned from you. That's amazing thing. We were all disciples. Yeah. How many people are watching this out there? You have any idea? Don't know yet. We'll we'll have a debrief with Linda. So we have a YouTube live channel also going in. There's a large cadre watch it later on so you can send the link out to others and All the right. links of your two movies you're a great movie maker i did not know that we send the links out to the chat room also so they'll be available for everybody to see yeah take a look at the bakey or a fight to the finish i got a third one that's going to come out before too long <laughs> the secret all right have thank a good you, night tony. everybody thank okay. you very much thank Bye -bye. you tony. thanks, thanks again tony have a good night